So hope you met somebody new today. Hope that if you're new with us, you met someone in our church family today. Um, if you are here for the first time, we are in the middle of a conversation in the book of Revelation. And um, we are talking about Thyatira today. I would normally put up some images from that church on the screen, but we don't really have any. There's just not much there. Um, the, they know the site. They know where it is, but there's a city built over the top of it. And so since the city didn't move since antiquity, there's just a little park with a church built in about five 600 A.D., and a bunch of like broken pieces of columns and things like that laying around. So since it wasn't a very interesting picture, and I've already shown it to you once when he zipped through this at the beginning, I thought I would just not do it today a second time. If you're looking in your Bible for the, uh, for the Church of Thyatira, it's in the book of Revelation. If you're new to the Bible, that's the last book in the Bible, and it is in chapter 2. And as you're looking through the churches, there are headings for them. And verse 18 says, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write. Okay? So, today I want to remind you of what I've been reminding you of each time. First of all, the letter was written as a chain letter to all seven churches. Okay? So who was this, church addre- this letter addressed to? Everybody, all seven of the congregations received this letter, okay? It went around from church to church in what was, I think, and I don't think I have a lot of people who would argue with me on this subject, that I think this was the preaching route of their primary leader, their bishop of the region. His name was John. This is John, who was a disciple of Jesus, who is presently on the island of Patmos, a prison colony, where they sent him after they were unable to French fry him. They tried boiling him in oil, and it is exactly what you would think it is. They tried boiling him in oil, and it did not harm him. That had to freak some people out. (laughs) He's swimming around in boiling oil going, this is nice, nice. Could you get some jets put in here? And they pull him out, they, since they can't kill him the way they hoped to, they send him off to Patmos thinking, we'll leave him out there. It's kind of like Alcatraz, sort of a place. It's a, it's a penal colony that's just an island. There's no fences, just water, and the occasional shark. So that's where he was when he wrote this letter. If you read the letter, it says things in here were sent in signs and symbols as it introduces the book. And if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see lots of signs and symbols. Probably the least symbolic pieces of it are in these first introductory notes to the various letters or various uh, leaders of the churches. Jesus is described as moving among the lampstands. The churches are the lampstands. Tells you right in the book. And holding the angels, the stars, the messengers to the seven churches in his right hand. Right hand being the hand of authority and power. He's got all these leaders. With me so far? Good, because I've repeated that to you now at least about four times. So that's where we are thus far. So understand that everybody reads all of the church's messages. So everybody reads everything. And that's why each of these letters ends, each of these messages to the churches end with he who has an ear. What's the expectation there? Everybody has an ear, right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the idea is, this is not a, point, a finger-pointing message. This is an apply-it-to-yourself message. That make sense? Because it would be really easy for each of the churches to kind of go, well, at least we didn't get that. As people in Thyatira, when we get to them, you'll see why. It's like, glad we didn't get Thyatira's message. But his, his statement to them and to all of us is that you need to take this and ask the question, how would this apply in my life? So how would this apply to me is what all of us should be seeing when reading these seven church letters, okay? I think a lot of us have looked, read the seven churches and said, oh, well, this applies to various churches in various historical settings, and we completely missed the message to us, okay? So today I want to talk to you about the message from, to Thyatira and to you and me, written by John while he was on the island of Patmos, passed around to all the churches for them to read, under the topic, under the, under the heading, under the title, no more burden. All right? Let's pray together for, together for a minute. 
As we open your word today, Lord, we ask that your word would speak to us, not the preacher. We ask your spirit to guide the process. That we might leave here today a step closer to you, or maybe a number of steps closer to you than we started the day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2, 24 and 25. Near the end of the message to the letter to, to Thyatira, it says, Now to you, I say. I'll come back to who the now to you is. I will put on you no other burden, but hold on to what you have, sorry, until I come. Sorry, my computers were down, computers, computers, computers were down, and so I did all of this with my thumb on my phone. So there might be more than just that one mistake for you to check out, okay? So when you're, when you're thinking about this, you can insert the have. Hang on to what you have. But I want to start with the... Next slide. I really would. Okay, it's working, but it's not working for you guys. So you guys give me the next slide. Thank you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, I write, These things says the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, and his feet like fine brass. So let me, uh, let me remind you that what, what is the angel of the church? The messenger to the church. The word translated directly as messenger. So the word gets translated a lot in the Bible as messenger. But in the context like this, where everything is so symbolic and, it, and things, they want to translate an angel all the time. But this church is maybe the best example of why this should be translated messenger. So now imagine you're the local elder or local pastor, that would be the same thing in the first century, leading the congregation at Thyatira. The message now says, and to the messenger of the church at Thyatira, you would take this personally. Okay? It's coming right at you, going 80 miles an hour, and it's, the brakes are out. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flaming fire. These are scary eyes. Eyes like flaming fire. And his feet are like fine brass. This is not my favorite image of Jesus. This is that image in the beginning of the book of Jesus moving among the lampstands and holding the messengers in his hand. And it's very Jesus-like, right? And now he's got eyes like flaming fire. Oh, I so want to tell you about the good times sitcom picture of this, but never mind. And feet like fine brass. And I can't figure out what the feet are about. It's a weird thing. My feet are like shiny brass things. Verse 19. Can we go on, fellas? I'm going to have to just depend on you. Could you give me the next slide? I know your works. Love, service, faith, and your patience. And for your works, the last is more than the first. Okay. Interesting set. Are these good things for your church to, be having, to have? Raise your hand if you think they're good things. Raise your hand if you think they're bad things. Again, raise your hand if you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> Non-cooperative folks. I know your works. Love. Love's a good thing. Service. Service is a good thing. Faith. Faith is a good thing. Your patience. Patience is a good thing, right? All of these are good things. As for your works, the last is more than the first. This is a, an interesting phrase. We don't know exactly what it means. I'll give you the two options. On the one side, it's getting better. They are getting better. As, your, as life has gone on, your works are getting better. Your works are growing. Your church is improving. Okay, that's one version of the argument for what this means. The other version is, your patience is greater than the others. Your patience is greater than love, service, faith, etc. Okay? I think it's this, this latter one. I think it's talking about the fact that they've elevated patience. Because patience can get you in trouble. Love is patient... Follow closely. Patience isn't always loving. Love is patient. Patience isn't always loving. Let me give it to you in a different, different light. 
If you are patient, if you are patient with your abusive spouse, is that a good idea? You just keep going back. If, you know, if I wait, if I'm patient, he'll get better. If I wait, if I'm patient, she'll get better. Yes, there are she's that are abusive. Most of them are he's, but occasionally there are she's. Is that a good idea? No. Is it a reasonable expectation? So here's the, here's the, uh, the, the math equation you can put in your brain. P greater than L equals what? When patience is greater than love, what happens? Corruption of love. Patience greater than love corrupts love, creates a corruption of love. Right? Well, you don't have to say right. It's my equation. You can say no. But I want you to consider it. Because of the trouble these folks end up in, because of the picture that gets painted of them in the text, I think that's what this is really referring to. You're doing a lot of good things, and they're great, but you've gotten an outsized picture of toleration and patience. Right? We'll carry on. Let's look at the next one, please. Can you give me the next slide, please? Thank you. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach. So let's just stop there for a second. This is not a text against uh, women in ministry or even women prophets, okay? It's a text about Jezebel. Do you know the story of Jezebel? Jezebel? That woman Jezebel, do you know the story? Yeah, it's, a, it's an Old Testament story that I want to take you really quickly back to take a look at. So we're going to look at 1 Kings first. 1 Kings chapter 16. Now Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab did what? Evil, evil in the sight of the Lord. More than all who were before him. So if you follow kings at all, if you remember the kings of the northern tribes of Israel, this is a pretty rough bunch, and they do a lot of pretty gnarly things. They do a lot of things that you wouldn't want your kids to be part of. You wouldn't want to get, show them this movie. You wouldn't probably want to watch it yourself. They do some pretty terrible, corrupt things, and Ahab is doing worse things than all of them before. Let me give you a quick general rundown. They've built a couple of temples, one in Samaria, one up in Dan. They've rebuilt the golden calves that were first represented back in Exodus. They've rebuilt golden calves, so now we, they're worshiping golden calves and saying these golden calves are actually God. So they're, they're kind of out there on the edge of what God would tolerate. They do a lot of worse things. They start doing worship of Asherah, and they start sacrificing their children to these gods. All kinds of crazy stuff is going on. Ahab comes along. He becomes the new king, and he's worse than all of them. He's the worst example in the whole Bible of how a king should behave. Okay? Okay. Let's see the next one. Verse 31. He took a wife. Now I'm giving you a piece of this text. Note the ellipses. There's three ellipses, so I left a part out at the beginning, a part out in the middle, and a part at the end, because I only want you to get this one piece of the information. He took a wife, Jezebel. She's the daughter of a king from a nearby country. And he went, uh, went and served Baal. Something happens when he takes Jezebel as his wife. He begins to serve Baal as well as all the other bad things he was already doing. Okay? So he becomes a Baal worshiper. The, the reason is Jezebel's big on Baal. Jezebel loves her Baal. Jezebel loves her Baal. Jezebel loves Baal. Jezebel. Got it? He builds a brand new temple to Baal in Samaria. Samaria is right in the heart of the whole nation, the whole land of Israel, and it's just a few miles from Jerusalem. Now you have Baal on a hilltop in Samaria and God on a hilltop in Jerusalem. 
and they are spitting distance away from each other. Well, that's, that's an overstatement. You could, if you were today firing a 1850s cannon, you could shoot from top to top. Okay? They're not very far from each other. And she and he bring Baal worship into the heart of the land. Can I have the next one, please? Jezebel. What's her name? Jezebel. Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord. So how are you feeling about this lady right now? Now, if, if you're the, the bishop of Thyatira, if you're the leader of that community, you would know the story of Jezebel. You would have had been familiarized with the scripture. You probably were a converted Jewish person because those Old Testament scriptural stories weigh into a lot of what you're going to teach people. So this guy who the, who's receiving this message probably already knows the story. It's, it's about a 99.9% .9 possibility that he knows this story. So he relates and understands what this woman did. She brought Baal worship into the heart of, of Israel. She even killed the prophets of God. So, as he's hearing this description of what he's allowed in his church, He's not feeling good about it. Sometimes when you're patient with someone who's way off the rails, you allow stuff to creep into your church, into your family, into your personal life that you wouldn't if you were doing the loving thing. even in loving of yourself. Nobody starts out their life choosing to be addicted. Nobody starts out their life choosing to be abused or be an abuser. No one starts out their life saying, I would like to live an immoral life. No one does. <coughs> but people allow it into their lives. People tolerate things at the beginning of a relationship that are the warning signs of where it's going. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is just say, I'm out. All the men I've ever dealt with who were caught in a cycle of pornography Start with something small. And it just grows and grows and grows and grows till it encompasses their entire life. And what they allowed in at the beginning when they just said, you know, this isn't that big a deal. Walked into a room with three little boys. These three little boys were sitting there. There was a bunk, room with bunks in it. And these three little boys were sitting there with a magazine. Okay? <laughs> As I walked in, an adult authority figure, they did this with the magazine. Shoved it under the bunk that they were leaning against. So I walked over, sat down next to the one furthest to the right. I said, so what are you boys looking at? Oh, nothing. We don't have anything. Well, I did see you shove the magazine under the bed when I came in to the room here. Well, and the one on the far left reached back, pulled it out. It was a magazine selling swimsuits. A first step. A step that might be considered pretty innocent. But here were these three gentlemen getting their first taste of ogling an image, in this case, in a, piece, in a magazine. It would be easy to just go, okay. Normal behavior for little boys, right? Wouldn't it be simple to just allow it? Just say, well, that's not terrible, but don't move on from here. Wouldn't it be easy just to shrug that off? 
Be patient with the system, the schools, the, the education, the biblical knowledge they've been given. Be patient with their conversion, all of that. Wouldn't it be easy just to let that go? I did sit down with them. I did talk to them about this was a starter kit for a trail they did not want to get on. I did not te- want to teach them too much about the trail that they were about to let themselves onto. But I did kind of tell them this is not a good thing for you guys to be sitting here privately doing because you all know that it feels both exciting and wrong. Even as a little kid, they knew it was exciting to them and it felt wrong to them. That's why they were hiding. Most people who get into drug abuse do not start with heroin. They start with some simple things, some small habit, the concept that my answer to my problem is in a pill bottle. I just take a pill. Whenever I have a problem, I take a pill. Whenever I get this, I take a pill. And you get in the habit of popping a pill to make you feel better. Popping a sandwich if you want me to get really in your life to make you feel better. For my personal life, going to Leatherby's, having a giant ice cream cone to make me feel better. When we start inserting things into our life that we think are allowable, we're patient with ourselves, we're patient with the decision, we're patient with whatever, and we allow something under the door that will erode the foundations of who we are spiritually and what we believe, and it will start tearing apart our life. Maybe I should have worn a tie. When Jezebel was a little girl, I'm pretty sure she, said she didn't want to be known as the worst queen in Israel who had ever lived. She didn't want to be a, a byword for a, a woman who is completely corrupt. You realize up until very recently, this was the woman you would call out in someone's life. They would say when somebody was really living a corrupt life, a female was living a, a really corrupt life, they would say, she's a Jezebel. Now we don't say things like that because we're very tolerant. But it was a pretty good description. So here in Thyatira, the elder of the church, the man who's responsible, starting to let this lady in. We'll give you a little bit more of her, uh, her track record. Guys, can you give me the next one? After Elijah confronts the idolatry on Mount Carmel, do you remember this story? It's a great biblical story. One of those great old stories. Elijah goes to the king and he says, bring me all the prophets of Baal and I'll come myself all by myself. We'll meet head to head, one on 450 on top of, the, of Mount Carmel and we will, we will face and decide right now forever. If God is God, then worship him. If Baal is God, then worship him. And they go to the top of the mountain and they build their altars. And he lets the Baal worshipers and their, their 450 prophets go first. He said, here's the rules. Here's the game. You got your altar over there. Baal's supposed to be the god of, of thunder and lightning and rain and all that sort of stuff. So here's what you have to do. You have to build your altar, put your sacrifice on your altar, and then call on Baal to light the fire for you. So they do. They get their altar there, and they start chanting. They start cutting themselves. They start going around. Elijah starts making fun of them. Your your English Bible doesn't say it, unless you have a different sort of English Bible. But in the Hebrew, he actually says to them when they've been shouting and cutting themselves for hours, he actually says to them, well, perhaps he's going to the bathroom. You should call a little louder. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's, you know, out of commission for the moment. But if he hears you, perhaps he'll come and answer the phone. He never shows up. Then about the time for the evening sacrifice. The day is waning on. Elijah builds his altar. He puts his sacrifice on the altar. He kneels down before the Lord and he says, Lord God, short story, demonstrate your power to all these people. Let all these people know that you are God and they are not. Baal is not, his, his worshipers are not, and his prophets, his priests, they're fake. Fire comes down from God, 
strikes the altar, consumes the offering, consumes the altar, and consumes all the water that Elijah poured it on top of the altar just to rub it in. After this confrontation where God is revealed to all, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying she's going to kill him too. She's already killed all the prophets she can find. We find out that there are 7,000 people in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. We also find that there are 100 prophets who've been stashed in caves and protected so that she couldn't kill them. This is the woman who the church at Thyatira has let in, and more significantly, they've let her teach. So she is now training the people in the church in this stuff. Got it? Have we irritated you enough? Not yet? Okay, we'll continue. Can you give me the next slide, please? Historically, Jezebel was an instrument in bringing Baal worship to Israel, and she killed the prophets of God. Clear enough? Clear enough. Carry on. So when he says, that woman Jezebel teaches my servants immorality and idolatry. That woman Jezebel, <laughs> I love this phrase, that woman. When somebody calls you that woman, is it going to follow, be followed by a compliment? Not usually. It might depend a little bit on the tone. That woman over there, that woman with the beautiful hair, that, that woman who's just having a baby, that woman... I get this as that woman, that woman Jezebel, that woman is now teaching immorality and idolatry. Do you notice that God claims the children she's teaching, claims the church she's teaching? She's teaching my servants. He said, these are my people, and you're allowing this crazy woman to teach them. Pretty strong, the message to Thyatira. <laughs> if you're the elder to Thyatira and they get to your church, we've read through the churches. Oh, well, you've got the Nicolaitans. Oh, you said that's terrible. Too bad for them. Oh, you've got Balaam. Oh, man, that's, that's terrible. Too bad for them. Oh, well, you guys, you're letting Jezebel teach. And therefore, you also have Balaam, which by implication also says you have the Nicolaitans, because that's what we've just learned in the previous two. Can you picture the elder? He's kind of shrinking into his seat a little. Suddenly, the floor has become quite interesting to him. Because what the Bible is saying, what the word from John, what Jesus is saying through John to him, to the messenger from the church at Thyatira, you have allowed this woman, this, this terrible represent, representative of, failured, uh, of failed systems of idolatry to teach. You've handed over your pulpit. You've handed over the, the, the teaching of the children, the teaching of the church, whatever it is. You've given it to her. Poor guy. I feel bad for him because that'd be a tough spot. Give me the next one, please. Then God says about her, I gave her time to repent. What does repent mean? Turn around. We're, go back in the direction of God. So did God care about the soul of Jezebel? Yes, this woman, whoever she is, whoever she is, she's not actually Jezebel, but whoever this woman is and whoever the old woman, the real Jezebel was, God is still after the hearts and souls of mankind. He is still trying to save everyone, no matter where they are. No matter where they are in the spectrum above, against him to for him. He's trying to get everybody home. Can we never forget that? Okay, I want you to get an image in your mind. Ready? Ready, for, ready to get an image. your least favorite politician. I don't say who it is. You can pick one from 100 years ago. I don't care. Your least favorite politician. And God is desperately trying 
to take them to heaven. You can pick a politician in a different country. You can pick somebody who's done heinous things. Jesus died for them. We cannot let that go. Well, then, Walt, shouldn't we be patient with them? Amen. Well, so far as love defines your patience. It is not loving to them or to the church for Jezebel to be teaching. Is that fair? It's not loving to her because this elder, this leader in the church should be saying to her, look, lady, um, you've gone around the bend a little too far with this thing. You're telling our people that under the pressure and the circumstances of the customs in the city where they live, it's okay for them to compromise in idolatry and immorality. You're telling them that it's okay for them to participate in the idolatry of those temples that are there in their, their community, and it is okay for them to participate in the immoral things going on inside certain of those temples. Because that was the pressure, remember? That was the, that was the water that they were swimming in. That was what they were all dealing with. The leader should have said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. But also, can you carry the next slide, please? But I also have a message for the rest of you. So I'm skipping down some of the bits and pieces about Jezebel and how God is dealing with her, okay? You can read those on your own. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira. So who's the rest of them? Those who have not accepted or followed after what this woman was teaching. Not her. The rest is not her. And the rest appears to be not those who support her. So I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. Okay? So the church always has those who are following after God with all their heart and those who are struggling to follow after God with all their heart, which is including both groups because those who are following after God with all their heart are still struggling to do it. And those who are going in a different direction. What do you do? What is the call for the person going in a different direction? When they're going on this road where the bridge is out, what is the call? The call is, to turn around before you get to the place where the bridge is out, where they can not, no longer be able to turn around. Right? It's quiet in the church this morning. That's a good thing in a Caucasian church, actually. I had to explain that's one of my friends who came to preach here once. If they're quiet, you got them. Next slide, please. And this is the, pa the place I would like to, to get to when love defines your behavior. I will put no more burden on you. God's grace for this church who needs to deal with the Jezebel problem. He said, I'm not going to make it harder for you. I'm not going to put anything heavier on you because you've got a big problem to deal with. It is never a good idea to grab another project when you're in the middle of a big project, right? I should say, it's rarely, rarely a good idea to grab another big project when you're already in the midst of a big project. And this was a life-determining, church-determining factor. If this church continues to go on the road they're on, their light's going to go out and they're done. And he says, look, you're in the middle of dealing with a state of idolatry and immorality in your church that will consume it. So I'm not going to put any other burdens on you. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to push you any further until you deal with that. Once that is dealt with, then you can move on. Let me stop you and apply this to you. How does this apply to you? Is there something in your life that you need to stop doing 
in order to get on with your relationship and the growth of that relationship with God? Have you hit a wall where your spiritual life has stopped? You keep studying, you keep praying, and you keep going, and you keep hitting the same wall. You know what the wall usually is? Conviction. You bang your head into conviction again and again and again, and all you get is bruises on your head. When you surrender to conviction, then you move on to growth. When you surrender to conviction, you move on to growth. You're the meanest, nastiest person in your neighborhood, and you know it. And yet you keep going to your neighbors and saying, come to church with me. Jesus loves you. And you can't figure out, well, no one's coming. But in the back of your mind, you hear the Spirit of the Lord say, well, you're the meanest, nastiest person in your neighborhood. Of course they're not coming. And you ignore it. And you go to your neighbor again, and you say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And they're like, I would not go to church with that lady on a bet. And you go back, and you're all disappointed, and you start praying to God. You say, God, come on. I'm doing this hard thing. I'm going to my neighbors, and I'm asking them to come to church, and no one will come. And God says, that's because you're the meanest, nastiest person in your whole neighborhood. And you say, no, I'm not. And then you pray the insincere prayer that says, okay, if I'm really the meanest, nastiest person in my neighborhood, show me. Do you know what you do after the show me? you start looking for somebody meaner and nastier than you. Because if you can do that, you can prove that you're not the meanest, nastiest person in your neighborhood. Right? And you bang up against that conviction, you bang up that conviction, and I'm just giving you an easy one. I'm slowing a big, throwing a big, slow, fat softball at you. It could be a lot worse. I could describe other things, but I think you get the point. If, if, some other idol is on the throne in your life and you're worshiping something that is not God, even if it's yourself, you got a problem. If I am running up against something that God is convicting me on day after day, week after week, month after month, and I'm not surrendering it to God and allowing it to be removed, I got a problem. Right? This church needs an operation. And Jesus says, well, well, hang on. Before we do the operation, let, let me talk to all those of you who are going to be responsible for holding the scalpel. No more burdens in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not burden you with anything more. I know the burden you're carrying. I'm not going to add any more weight. You got it? Do you see the grace and love of God in this? It is easy to throw these churches all under the bus and walk away. It is easy to say to the church of Thyatira, man, they are a mess. Look at that Jezebel thing they got going on. And move on. But what Jezebel is teaching you What source are you taking in that you know is bad for you? What source of information, person, electronic, thought life, imagery, images, what things are the Jezebel teaching you? What things are the Jezebels leading you away from God into immorality or idolatry? Immorality is a, is a big category. Idolatry is a big category. Idolatry is anything that goes ahead of Jesus. Anything that I surrender to that is not God. Immorality, oh, well, that takes my thought life to my physical life down a hole, away from the character that God designed me to be. The more I preach, the more I think I definitely should have worn a tie today. Can I have the next slide? But hold fast till I come. The last thing before he says, he who overcomes... Do you ever see that picture 
of the cat hanging on to the knot. It was, it was very popular a while ago. It'll come back because these things cycle around. It's this picture of this little cat. It's not a big, not a big old hairy cat from the alley. It's a little cat, probably still mostly a kitten. And there's a rope, and it's got claws into this knot at the end of the rope. He's saying, hang on. Just hang on till I come. I'm not going to give you anything else to weigh you down. You're holding on by your claws right now. I'm not going to burden you with anything else. So church at Thyatira, you need to take Jezebel out of the teaching cycle. You can't let her have the pulpit anymore. You can't let her teach the people anymore. You need to rectify what she's led them away from. You need to teach them the direction that God wants them to go. You need to help them get back. You need to help them find their way. They need to repent and restore their relationship with God. And those of you who have not fallen into this giant hole, I understand the job ahead of you is hard. Hang in. I'm not going to burden you with anything else. So I want to talk to you. Have you been following something that's lead you away, leading you away from God? Turn around and go back. Take the steps backward. Follow the path you've been on. Go back. Have you been teaching others? Immorality? Idolatry? Have your own brewing? Man, that's a, a large spectrum of stuff. You could be idolizing your, uh, your health serums. You could be idolizing your favorite shows. You could be idolizing a lot of things. Let it go. God's not down that road. I want to finish with something I say to you a lot. But I don't want you to miss it because you've heard it. Okay, is that enough of a premise? God is trying to get you into heaven. He is not trying to keep you out. Hold that firmly. When conviction falls hard on you, when God hits you between the eyes with some conviction, I want you to hear my voice echoing in your ear. God is trying to get you into heaven, not keep you out. He is trying to bless you, not to harm you, because he loves you enough to die for you. These are the facts of the gospel. These are the motivations of God in his convicting spirit. These are the desires of God for your life. He wants to get you into heaven. He's trying to bless you. And he was willing to die to make that happen. The church of Thyatira was asked to repent and hang on. The church that was walking away from him was asked to repent. The church that was already trying to stay away from the things being taught in their very own congregation was told to hang on. I will, I will not add any other burdens to you. You had enough right now. It's so where you find yourself on that spectrum today. Then you know your job. Let's pray. Father God, as the church at Ephesus read this letter or the church at Laodicea read this letter, there were some who knew that they had been following Jezebel for a while. They knew that they were walking away from you, that they were choosing idolatry and immorality over what it means to follow God with a pure heart and mind, what it means to be as you want us to be, to be in a blessable place, be in a blessable space. Lord, our desire is to, to follow you 
and to trust your leadership. Would you please convict us of the places where we are going sideways and away from you? And you would, you, would you please strengthen our weak hearts to trust you enough to just follow. I pray for your convicting spirit for all of us, including the preacher. And I pray for courage to follow you wherever you lead in the absolute knowledge that you're trying to get me home, you're trying to bless me in the process, and you're willing to die to make it possible. 